Hello, everybody. Hello, and welcome to the live stream. How y'all doing today? You like that? That southern twang in my voice? How y'all doing? Wow, Josh Dillon already with the super chats. Or is that a super sticker? I am, I have not been doing this long enough to uh, recognize the difference. Um, but welcome. Today we're going to be talking about how to pass a job interview, and we're going to be focusing on another of these wonderful job interview questions that everybody loves so much. Where do you see yourself in five years? Uh, I see we have three people uh, joining us live. Um, if you are here, there is a chat, uh, usually to the right, <laughs> like there is in every other live stream on the planet. Uh, say who you are. Say where you're listening from. I'm actually very interested. Um, I got my weekend hair. I got my Red Bull. So let's get into it. We're going to be talking about the pitfalls of this question, how to answer it correctly, and what they're, what they're trying to do by asking it. What's the reasoning involved in asking this question, what they're hoping to get from you. Because uh, like a lot of job interview questions, this one, it's very dangerous. It's a trick question. It sounds very benign. And if you don't know why they're asking and what they're looking for, you might walk into this and reveal a whole bunch of things about yourself that you don't realize that you're revealing. And a lot of them are bad. And uh, there's opportunities to get eliminated by answering this, you think you're giving a good answer, but actually you just eliminated yourself. So we're going to talk about that today. Um, we got 19 people. That's jumped up to 19. So hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining me. I really appreciate you being here live to do this. Look at that. Listening from Nairobi, Kenya. Awesome. Nairobi, the capital of Kenya, everybody. Um, that's great. So hello. Uh, thank you for joining me. And uh, like always, I'm going to start off talking about this particular topic, and if you have any questions, ask them in the chat, and I will uh, do my best to get to them. If it scrolls too fast for me to keep up with things, the way around that is to give a super chat or a super sticker so it stays on the screen, and if you do, I promise I will answer it properly, fully, completely, to the best of my ability. Hello from Germany! Awesome. Hello, Patrick. Hello from Canada. Um, this is great. You know, it's, it's awesome being able to talk to people from uh, all around the world at the same time. So awesome. It must be late in Germany. You guys are, what, seven hours ahead of where I am? I think uh, I'm in central time in, in North America. So that's GMT. Is it GMT plus six, I think? <clears throat> anyway. So uh, Barcelona. <laughs> Hello, Alex from Barcelona, Spain. I'm doing great. It's the weekend. Um, actually, normally where I am in Winnipeg, Canada, it's really, really sunny outside. But right now we're having some thunderstorms. So uh, if lightning should strike the window behind me and you see uh, a really fat guy scream for like a second before the feed is cut, uh, you will understand, I'm sure. And if you don't hear from me ever again, you'll know why. Uh, hello from Sweden. Awesome. It's 9 p.m. 9 p.m. in Germany. That's great. It's great to see you all. Thank you very much. Um, as I say, the ultimate goal of talking is about furthering our careers. The immediate problem is to pass a job interview. But if you've seen my live streams before, I'm not limiting uh, the discussion just to pure job interviews. It's anything that's going to further your career. So alternate ways of getting jobs, getting jobs on the hidden job market. Um, and hopefully at some point we'll get into more advanced career type stuff. And maybe we'll do a little bit of that today, hopefully, if people want. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to start off with is how to answer that job interview question. Okay, I've done a video on this. Maybe you've seen it, but just in case you haven't, we're going to do the whole thing over again here. So a common interview question is they'll ask you the question about the future. Okay. They ask you about your strengths, your weaknesses, um, ask you to give an introduction. They ask you about stress. And then they'll have one question where they ask you about your future. Usually it's phrased like this question. Where do you see yourself in five years? There's many variations of that. They could say, where do you see yourself in 10 years? Or what are your ambitions? You see, that sounds like a completely different question because none of the words are in common, but it's actually the same question. What they're looking for is a blind prediction from you about your future. Now, 
anyone with a somewhat scientific brain will understand that that's kind of hard to do when you're at a junction point in your career. You're at this job interview. You may get the job or you might not. And you don't know yet how that's going to go. And they're asking you to predict what's going to happen in the future. Now, that prediction could go wildly different ways, depending on if you get this job, among many other things. So it sounds like a very hard question to answer because you will not be able to give an accurate prediction of your future uh, for a variety of reasons. But that's what they're asking you. So why are they asking you this question? Well, here's the reasoning that a lot of interviewers, whether they're hiring managers or recruiters, this is what they're they're using. OK, first of all, the job interview is about soft skills. It's not about your technical skills. OK, they want to see you in person so that they can determine if you're the right person for the job. Now, a lot of that is not going to be your your technical skills. It's going to be the type of person you are and what your expectations are and what your ambitions are and what your goals are. Okay. You could be technically qualified for the job, but if you hypothetically hated doing that kind of work and you don't like that company and you would much rather be somewhere else in life, chances are you're not going to work out. You're probably going to quit early. Maybe you'll quit the first chance you get when a better job comes along. Right? So this is why they're asking this question. Okay, they want to know what you really want to do with your life. Now, you could probably see where this is going. If you answer, oh, I'd much rather be somewhere else, right? You basically fail the question. And a lot of times you will eliminate yourself on the spot because no matter how much they like you as a person, no matter how uh, you fit all the technical requirements for the job, if you want to be somewhere else and you have no interest in really doing this work, you're not going to work out. It would be silly of them to hire you because you would be a high risk candidate. You would most likely leave and you would most likely not work out because this really isn't what you want to do. And you've just admitted that. So that's what they're looking for when they ask this question. So it's a very deceptive question. They might ask you like, what are your hopes and dreams? What are your goals in life? Where would you like to be in life? Right? They, they could package it all these different ways. And the unsuspecting job interviewer uh, or candidate walks into this and you think like, oh, great. I love being asked that question. Let me tell you what my hopes and dreams are. This is a topic that we generally enjoy talking about. If somebody comes up to you and asks you, what are your hopes and dreams? And it's a person you like, chances are you're going to enjoy being asked that and you're going to have something to say, right? And it might be a long answer too. So this is a trap. They ask you this. And if in actuality, this job is not really your end goal of your life, you might start saying you would rather be somewhere else. And here's where you'd rather be. And this is why. Right. And they're listening to this and they've got like, you know, a look of interest on their face. Meanwhile, they've just eliminated you. OK, so that's the problem with this question. So you have to once again be guarded with your answer. Now let's go to the other extreme. Okay, let's go to the other extreme. Now that we know what they're trying to do, what if we said, no, 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 in five years, I want to be here. This job, this is all I've ever wanted to do in my life. Work customer service at this shoe store. This is my nirvana. Okay, if you hire me, I will be in ecstasy every day I, I walk through the door for the duration of the time I'm here because I'm just so privileged and so happy to be here doing what I love. Now, if you say something like that, um, that could go a couple of different ways, right? Maybe they believe you, but maybe it sounds too good to be true. Okay, so the question is, if you play into what they're trying to do and you give an extreme answer where this job is the ultimate destination and ultimate goal of your life, they may not believe you, and they'll regard that answer as you're being disingenuous. You're, you're lying to them. You're not being honest. And they will eliminate you then because they feel that you're lying to them in the interview, right? So you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. So how do we answer this question? Well, first off, the right thing to do, in my opinion, when faced with this question, 
okay, is first, you don't want to be sucked in to giving a lot of information when they ask you this question. You want to try and keep your answer as short as possible so that once again, you can get off this question very quickly and get back to answering other questions that are good. Like if they ask you, why do you think you're qualified? That's a question where you want to talk and you want to say a lot of things. Okay, you want to give them many reasons to hire you. This question, you don't want to say a lot of things. Okay, because the more you say, the it's like they're giving you more rope to hang yourself, right? You're get, there, there's more chances of you eliminating yourself the longer you talk. Okay, so we want something very short, very concise. We want to answer the question. We don't want them to think we're lying. And then we want to get off it as soon as possible. So long story short, I recommend that if somebody asks you, where do you see yourself in five years? You could say some variation of this job. That wouldn't be a bad answer. But what would be even better would be to say, well, I expect to be advancing uh, based on my performance. And then you shut up and you let them move on to the next question. You don't start filling the silence with more details. Okay, you let them fill the silence with more details. This is not a question we want to spend time on. And everything you say here, every minute you talk, it's one less minute where you will be able to give them reasons to hire you by answering another question that you want to talk. Okay, so that's kind of the long and short of this question. Okay. Um, ooh, somebody says, how to join Goldman Sachs. Unfortunately, I would not be the answer to that. I was never employed at Goldman Sachs. Uh, Goldman Sachs is a large United States-based uh, investment bank. Uh, I have an MBA in finance, a master's degree in finance, but I, I haven't worked in the banking industry. Uh, I also know that Goldman Sachs and a lot of those companies, they have very formal processes for what they look for. Um, that's the type of environment where something like an MBA would be useful. Okay, an accredited MBA. It's recognized and valued. Um, they look for experience and they look for certain personality traits. Um, oh, Venezuela. Venezuela is here. Hey, Gabriel from Venezuela. Hello. Sad and happy at the same time to be here. I can understand that. I mean, uh, presumably if you're here, uh, you're looking for a job. You're trying to get hired. And, you know, that's, at, you're at your one of your lowest points in terms of self-confidence, in terms of being sure of yourself. Um, so yes, but don't worry. I just want you to know that everybody has value. Everybody, a lot of people have a lot of value, but you don't feel that way when you're searching for a job. And it's an illusion. Martin Taylor says, my weaknesses are I work too hard and I care too much. See, this is a case of, like I was just talking about, it's sort of like the perfect answer. The problem is, no one believes you when you say it, because it is perfect. It's like, if, you, um, if you're doing some kind of entrepreneurial thing, and you are trying to advertise the thing that you do so that you get customers. If you say, oh, this will save you money, you know, or it'll make you money, it's the perfect answer. Of course, people are interested in saving money. Every single person is interested in saving money. Most other people are interested in making money. The problem is, is that when you say that this product will save you money, nobody believes you. They're thinking, of course you're going to say that. You're trying to sell it. I don't believe that. This is the problem, right? So we might know what the perfect answer is. The challenge is making it believable. And that applies in a job interview. That applies in a sales pitch. That applies in a lot of different situations. Thomas White says, it is, is it good to state how long you think you'll want to be at the company? For example, five to 10 years, or is that a big no? Um, I would not recommend that for two reasons. Number one, the correct answer is you want to be here forever. 
Okay. That's what they want you to say. That's what they want to believe. Okay. Now let's face it. That's probably not going to be the answer. Most people truthfully would give, but, um, that's what they want to hear. Okay. Second thing is if you're putting an end point on it, that's something negative. It's like, you're essentially saying, I'm going to work here for this long. No more. Now, what impression does that leave you with? That leaves you with, well, I've got a problem working here in, in some way, shape or form. So for that reason, I, I, I would not, that would not be my first answer. It's not the worst answer in the world, but it's not the greatest for that reason, in my opinion. Uh, thank you for all the information. This also is helping a lot with the current job. Yes, a lot of, a lot of things that you, a lot of skills you learn in a job interview. They will help you in your career. That means when you're in your current job, that means when you're in a future job, okay? Essentially, you're selling yourself and you're learning about people. You're, you're interacting with people, okay? You're managing their expectations. You're managing the impression you give off, okay? And these are life skills, okay? These will help you in a variety of situations, not just when you're trying to get hired, okay? If you're trying to, uh, if you're at work and you're making some kind of proposal to your boss or your coworkers, maybe they're looking for solutions and you say, uh, I got an idea. How about we do this? Right? You're wanting them to take your suggestion over possibly other people's suggestions. Okay. The same skills apply. Um, I have to scroll back because that's scrolled away. Let's see here. Uh, like departments that are linked to other departments, payables, and full knowledge. Yes, yes, exactly. Um, hello from Egypt. Hello. Hello. I have some ancestors that came. Well, do you, do you call great-grandparents ancestors? I don't know if that's demeaning to them, but... Uh, that came from Egypt. Some branch of the family tree all the way there. Um, what happens if you don't realize, if you don't know how much to get paid, you're really good, but they offer you less money than dishwashers. You're a prep cook. Then they give you, what? They give you a dollar raise just matching you to dishwasher. Listen, um, yeah, this is where we get into salary. Salary is a huge topic. I'm going to do a live stream dedicated to that sometime soon. Um, the bottom line is they will always offer you much less than, you know, than you're worth because there's a chance they can get away with it. You'll say yes. And a lot of people do, especially younger people that are new to this. Uh, this is how they get you. You know, they're, it's like you, when you go to the store and you want to buy, I don't know, a loaf of bread or whatever you're buying at the store. Um, that, you know, a loaf of bread costs, let's say $1. Okay. Um, or whatever unit of currency you're using. Well, if you find somebody who's giving, who's selling a loaf of bread and it's the same quality bread for a 10th of that, you're going to think great bonus. I got the, I got the right product for cheap. This is good. You know, that sense of, uh, good feeling you get, like you got a good deal, right? That's how they feel. So if there's a chance that they can get you for a little, only a little bit of money, that's what they're going to try and do. Okay. And they're going to apply all kinds of psychological means to put pressure on you to accept it. The most common is to say, you know, urgency. Oh, you know, you've, you've got to give us an answer now, right? Because tomorrow this job will not be here, right? Just they'll say whatever they have to say. It's not true but they'll say whatever they have to say to get you to say yes. The other one is, uh, you know, the stiff competition thing. Like, oh, if you don't say yes now and agree to this, I've got five other people lined up that are just as good as you or better. And they'll say yes. You know, you have no choice. That, that's, that's a standard tactic. It's a very cheap tactic, but it works. It works on, on uh, dare I say, noobs like younger people that have not been through this a lot of times and they haven't seen the pattern yet. And also if you're absolutely desperate for a job, like you need money now 
and you know you need this job no matter what you have no options really you just have to accept the first thing that comes along then they get you too for a, for a, a good deal good deal for them bad deal for you uh somebody says uh how to keep list Happy to keep listening. I found a job last year thanks to the information you gave me with the videos. Thank great, great. Hi from Prague, Czech Republic. Awesome. When I was a kid, I remember it was called Czechoslovakia, and I had to learn all the capitals of all the countries in like the world, I think. And uh Czechoslovakia Prague. Czechoslovakia Prague. That's how I that's how I remembered it. Uh Gabriel says, Hi Bill, I'm back. I hope you're doing well. I am doing well. It's the weekend. I uh, w was more efficient today by spending less time grooming my hair. You know, CEOs should, uh, you know, they, they haven't really explored the uh, celebrity grooming options that, you know, people like Lady Gaga and stuff have blazed the trail for. I think they should, you know. Why is it that, you know, red carpet celebrities can command a room just by the way they look, you know, but CEOs can't. I think that's got to change in the 21st century. Um, someone says, I got a second interview Wednesday. Your advice definitely helped during the first interview. Great, great. Yeah, the second interview is usually when they, it gets a lot more serious. The first interview, if they have multiple rounds of interview, the first interview is just to weed out people that are obviously, you know, not what they're looking for. The second interview is where they actually take a much harder look at you because they're actually considering hiring you. It's not just sort of like a pass fail thing. Now they're going to like actually think about it. So they go a lot deeper in the second interview. Nothing to worry about. Just keep doing what you're doing. It's usually the same questions. Uh, they may ask you more behavioral based questions in the second interview. Uh, more stories, more stories from your past about your accomplishments, about overcoming, uh, you know, issues or certain things. So make sure that you have plenty of those prepared. You got a nice big library rehearsed in your head on the tip of your mind so that whatever uh, behavioral based interview question they ask you where they say, tell me a story, tell me about a time you did this. You can pull something out immediately. It fits. Okay. So, uh, yeah, don't let, don't let your guard down on the second interview. Some people do that. They think, oh, they're calling me back. They must like me. We're friends. So it's a little less formal. It's a little more of a friendly conversation. So I shouldn't have to prepare as much as I did for the first one. Nope. Alonzo says, also got hurt at work. Um. Oh, I guess this, I'm, I'm missing a few here. It's starting to scroll, blah, 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 blah. it's starting to scroll fast. It's been six months after I've graduated. I still haven't received a job offer. I'm getting interviews, but nothing so far. I've even reached out to hiring managers on LinkedIn, but nothing yet. Keep trying. Okay. Um, a good job search, like I've said, it's multi-pronged, multi-armed. Respond to posted job ads. Also try reaching out to hiring managers. I've done some videos on that. Uh, I also go much deeper on how to do that in my course because it's a little more complex. You've got to have certain things in place. For example, if you're reaching out to hiring managers on LinkedIn, your LinkedIn profile has to be good, okay? Because the most obvious thing they're going to do is if you contact them and they don't know you, they're going to see who you are. They're going to look at your profile. And if there's something on there that's kind of iffy, then uh, it's probably not going to, it's not going to work out. So also the way you approach them, what you say, very important. Okay. So like several things have to be in place for that to work. Okay. But it's really not rocket science. You, you get them in place and then you do them and it, and it's uh very effective. Okay. Um, if anyone is interested, I got to plug it sometime. Uh, I have a course called uh, Get Hired. Link in description. Um, it's like the whole shebang a bang. Step by step. All organized. What to do first. What to do second. Um, talks about how to ace job interviews. It talks about how to get jobs on the hidden job market. It talks about other... Um, 
you know, not mainstream ways of getting jobs that are very effective. Um, okay, here. So Alonso says, also got hurt at work. Boss put, I was hurt off work. What do I do? Workers comp goes after their insurance comp, but they say my boss can't deny the claim. Well, look, uh, every country has its own laws on workers' compensation, how it works. Okay. Um, so, I mean, I, I can tell you all about workers' comp in my own country and possibly the United States a little bit, but, um, but yeah, you'd have to just read the rules. The best thing, okay, is to go online and go to uh, do a Google search on workers' compensation in your region, okay? Uh, in most countries, it's written right into the law, and you can read the law directly yourself. Just, it's all available online, the laws that apply to you. And they're not written in legalese uh, for most countries. They're written in plain language that everybody can understand. You can uh, look at that, and that will tell you your rights. That will tell you what you're entitled to. Then you go look up that particular company and how they handle it and what their process is. Okay, but beyond that, I can't really advise on that stuff. Um, maybe talk to an expert. Talk to, uh, if the company has somebody that's uh, some kind of workman's compensation uh, contact, you could try that. They might not always advise you uh, what's in your interest. But if you have a union or something like that, they certainly can help you there. Okay, uh, Will says, I'm finding that virtual interviews are more challenging than in person. I feel like I used to get more second interviews or offers when the interviews were in person. Well, a possible reason for that is because in-person interviews are more complex and time-consuming to set up. Uh, people have to travel. You have to receive them uh, and all that. So they can do more virtual interviews than they, than they could do face-to-face -face interviews. And because they can do more of them, maybe there's a uh, stiffer competition. That might be a reason. Um, hanging with Courtney says, hi. Hi, hanging with Courtney. It's good to see her. C-Rock. I like that. C-Rock. What resources do you recommend for job hunting? Burnout. Specialized professional. You mean like people? Like a professional to consult? Um, look, if... I don't know about people, but this is what I'd recommend. If you're feeling burnout, okay, I know this isn't always 100% possible, but take a little break, even if it's just a day, okay? Go and do something fun as much as possible. Get your brain, get your mind thinking about something else other than job search, okay? Even if it's just for like an evening or something like that, okay? Like if you watch TV or you play video games or you do sports or whatever it is that, that you do for fun, try and do a little bit of that. Just force yourself to do it. You may not feel like it. Force yourself to do it. Disengage. Think about something else, even for a moment before you resume. Then, like I've said, there's many different techniques to find a job, many different ways of doing it. Depending on the type of person you are, you may prefer one or or a couple of things over some other things okay uh extroverts will pr will prefer like talking to people introverts will prefer like being online um you know and so on right so tailor it to the types of activities that you can tolerate more okay i know that might seem pretty obvious but but that does help okay that applies to any type of burnout really that you might be dealing with in life uh, that, that's my sort of one minute answer on that. But yeah, that's a great start. At least start with that. Okay. If you're doing a certain thing and it's not effective, like it's, it's not really yielding a lot of results quickly, try something else. Force yourself to try a different technique. Okay. And if that produces a lot more results quickly, then switch over to that technique. Don't just stay with the same one way of getting a job even if it's not like really producing a lot of results. Uh, Mohammed says you helped me so much in getting my interview skills improve your student from Lahore, Pakistan. Right on, right on. Hello, Pakistan. And I appreciate you saying that. I'm glad it's uh, helping. 
do you think that just sending DMS to connect to LinkedIn hiring managers is a good idea to get hired? I would like to skip the stuff and get down to business. Well, look, if, if you're not into it, then obviously it's not right for you. Um, the thing is, it's not just as simple as sending, like, just, I'm just going to send messages to people. There's several, like I said, there's several things that have to be in place or else it won't be effective at all. Okay. Like, for example, walking, physically walking through the front doors of a business and, you know, without an appointment, without knowing anybody, uh, that is actually a good way to get a job. But you have to do certain things. Okay. Um, Okay, you go to the receptionist, you ask to talk to the the manager, the person in charge. Chances are they won't be available. You say, that's fine, not a problem. I would just like, I'm going to leave this. Could you see that they get it, please? Right, it's maybe your resume, maybe your, if you have a business card, you can print them up for like extremely cheap these days. So you should have a little business card, says your name, says what you do, uh, your contact information. And then you get the name of the person they're going to give it to and, you know, possibly their phone number, although you don't need that. And then you call on a phone later and you try and reach that person. Either you call their direct number if you have it, or you call the switchboard and you get patched through. But you have a reason for calling now. You say, I'm following up, just following up. Just make sure that you got my resume and my card that I left at the front desk. Uh, Just following up to see if you got that. And then the only other thing you're going to say is, um, you know, look, I have some skills in this area. I would love to work for your company. I know that you guys do some interesting work in this area. If ever you're looking for someone who can do this, just let me know. Thank you very much. That's it. Right? So if you do something like that, it can be very effective. They're impressed by your initiative. You know, the fact that you must want to work there specifically if you're going to do this right? Um, You've demonstrated how professional you are. You've demonstrated your communication skills, your persistence, your professionalism. If they read your resume and your card and it looks really good, that's also a demonstration of something you do. And if ever they happen to be looking, chances are they will call you. And if you keep doing that, it's very effective. But if you walk through the door and you don't do that, you do something else. You say, I want to talk to the boss. And they say, well, no, sorry, he's not available. And then you get upset. And said, well, I came all the way down here about, you know, obviously it's going to be completely ineffective, right? So it involves going through a certain protocol. When you contact hiring managers on LinkedIn, there's also a certain protocol you have to follow. Okay, it's the difference between being very effective and being totally ineffective. Hello to California. Alonzo is from California. Hello, California. Oh, I need some Red Bull. You know, when you first drink Red Bull, like a lot of those energy drinks, the first one usually tastes like crap. But then you keep drinking it. And then it tastes good. And then it tastes like the best thing you've ever had in your life. Is this a bad thing? That's probably the first signs of crippling addiction. Uh, Somebody says, I think what's holding me back is I don't have any actual work experience. I do have volunteering experience, though. Well, listen, that's a good start. Okay, this is is the catch-22 that a lot of younger people uh, encounter. How do you get your first job when you don't have any career-related experience? There's a couple of solutions. I I, I said a couple of them last time. Long story short, is you can get a job in the hidden job market, like kind of like what I was just describing. You walk into a company and do it that way. You do uh, the same type of thing, but on LinkedIn, you know, you do it remotely where you contact hiring managers, you say the right thing to them. Um, And in those cases, they're hiring you not based on your resume, but based on what you've just demonstrated to them. The fact that you contacted them, the fact that you were professional, the fact that they got the impression that they would like to deal with you. Okay, you said the right things. Okay, so they're not hiring you based on what experience is written on your resume. They're hiring you on what they've just seen with their own eyes. Okay, that's why they hire you. 
So that can be a way to break that catch 22. Another way is to actually do something, okay? Instead of, um, this is going to sound bad, but I don't mean it bad. Uh, instead of like sitting around searching for jobs and not getting anywhere, at the same time, you could also be doing something of your own. You could be putting up a website. You could be starting a YouTube channel. You could be, uh, you know, offering services for sale. You could be, uh, you know, creating a product and trying to market it. Like, like whatever. Things that are cheap and simple to do at home don't require permission from anyone else. And you're doing something. And if you get anywhere with it, that's the experience you put on your resume. So you could say, look, I have experience creating and marketing my own product. I've done something. Several people have bought it. That's my experience. I've created my own experience. Okay. Um, there are also some companies out there, and you, I'm sure you know this, that, that they make it a point to hire people right out of school. Okay. So the fact that you don't have any experience, that's not a, a, a deal breaker for them. Okay. They are actively looking for people that don't have experience. And they may be good for like a first career job. Okay, like when I, when I was starting off in my career, I worked for uh, GE, General Electric. Uh, they made it a point to hire people right out of school. So I didn't have any career experience, but they took me and a whole bunch of other people anyway. Um, there's a lot of companies like that. They're usually not the world's greatest jobs, but they're a good start. And then you have something to put on your resume. Um, and you're on the inside of that industry, if that's the industry you want to work in. Uh, what helped me the most of your teachings was the silence part. After answering a question with a good answer, I just pause and let them continue. It truly helped and keeps helping. Good. Yeah, that's, that's part of talking to people. If you have a, a tendency to never stop talking because you feel this pressure to fill the silence, that's a negative thing. It can lead you to say too much, to reveal things that should not have been revealed. And it also takes away from the impact of what you just said. So if you say one thing, like this is my answer, and I, and I leave it at that, but then you talk for another three minutes because they're not speaking, so you fill the silence by, keep, you keep going, that takes away from the impact of like the answer that, that you originally gave. So yeah, that's, that's definitely something. And in a lot of interviews, recruiters rely on those kind of cheap psychological tactics to get you to disclose things. You know, remember, uh, in the vast majority of cases and in the countries around the world, there are exceptions, but in the vast majority, they can't check up on you. They can't verify stuff from you. I mean, there's some things they can do. They can check references and things like this, but really, they can't really investigate you. They rely on you giving information about yourself that they then use to judge you, right? So it's very important that we filter, you know, what we say. Negotiation is like that too. If you're like negotiating a business deal, I mean, you don't want to just speak freely and give them like all kinds of information about what you're doing and what, you know, that's not to your advantage. It's like playing a game of poker where you show them all your cards, right? You keep your cards to yourself. You don't want them to know what you're bargaining with it turns out much worse for you. So I'm glad you said that. I'm glad that came in handy. That's definitely a skill. Um, it's hard. It's hard when you're nervous. But this is why practicing doing mock interviews with a friend or a family member, this is where it pays off. Okay. Uh, any successful tips to cold approach hiring managers on LinkedIn? Yeah. Yeah, I have a lot of them. It's, it, I can't say them all in like, like right now, but uh, that's why I have a course where I talk for something like well over an hour at least, like a couple hours, just on that. Okay, with, with scripts and templates and things like this and explaining the reasoning behind it. It's, it's so important that you know the reasoning 
rather than just saying a line or, or saying a script. Because if you say it in the wrong context or, you know, it, it likely won't be successful. Don't delete this live. Yeah, a lot. What I've been doing is I've been uh, taking these live streams, and I haven't been keeping the stream up on my channel. I have been reposting it like a couple of days later, and that's what I intend to do with this one. Um, so all your comments are going to be like they're they're baked into the video, so they're there, so everybody will be able to see. You'll be able to see. You'll be able to tell all your friends that you had that fifteen minutes of fame on the company's expert and they'll say who and you'll say exactly um okay when the hiring manager in the interview says to you that you are doing really well and answering really well do you believe it no <laughs> listen if they're giving you a compliment yes yes okay the general rule of thumb is that they can either be lying to your face or they could be genuine okay um you don't know so if you don't know just take the compliment at face value. Don't question it. Okay? Hopefully it makes you feel better. Don't let it lead you into making a mistake. Maybe getting too comfortable and a little too friendly, uh, being on friendly terms with them and then start to reveal more personal, more intimate, kind of more, more detailed stuff that you shouldn't reveal. Okay? It could be a tactic to do that, I suppose. But listen, if I didn't know the person, I would just take it at face value. Okay, for example, when you guys are giving me these occasional compliments and saying, you know, this helped me, I'm not questioning it. I, I don't know if that's like flattery or you mean it genuinely. I'd like to think people mean it genuinely. So I'm just taking it like that and uh, I'm using it to make the, hopefully to make the interaction more positive. And that's how I would take that. But don't let it lead you into doing anything bad. That's all I'll say. Okay, and remember, anything they say to you, it's just words. It doesn't mean anything. The only thing that matters is getting a written job offer. Okay. So after the interview, they can compliment you as much as they want. If they're not delivering anything, if they're not giving you a, um, uh, an offer, some things I've heard are people will compliment you and say like, don't, don't apply for any more jobs. Okay. We really want to talk to you again. You were awesome. You know, something like that. So what do you do? You take it at face value. You stop applying for other jobs thinking that these people are about to give you an offer. They don't. And, and now you've suffered. You, you stopped applying for jobs that you could have gotten, right? So, you know, compliments are nice. But remember, the only thing that matters is that they give you an offer letter, okay? Nothing else they say really matters in any real way. Okay. You go to the interview, you do your best. If it works out, great. If it doesn't, don't sweat it. It's more a matter of random chance than it is any kind of reflection on you. Okay. That's the number one thing you got to realize. It's a numbers game. Your focus should then not be on this interview you did, not be like, you know, you know, like thinking about like any day now they should get back to me. You shouldn't be thinking about it anymore. You should be focusing on the next interview opportunity you're going to create for yourself and how you're going to do on your next interview okay it's also a good thing to try and manage the stress um when the hiring manager in the interview says to you that you are doing really okay i saw read that honestly red bull is the best energy drink in my opinion still yeah i haven't tried a whole bunch of others i'm i just tried red bull I got hooked. Every once in a while, I give it up. Then I get, then I start drinking it again. And as I've said, that's how I've maintained my physique. You know, it's not easy looking like this. You know, you really got to hit the energy drinks hard. How do you approach the salary expectation question? I feel like asking them for a range doesn't work in Europe. <laughs> uh... Yeah, I, I don't like that. Oh, in my country, this doesn't work. I, I don't like that. Possibly within certain industries where they have, um, you know, certain practices, some types of answers may not work. For example, um, 
If you're asking about a range, maybe in a certain industry that's regulated by a regulatory body, they may have a standard pay scale. So the salary is not negotiable. Everyone must get a certain salary for a certain position by law. So, okay, granted that you do, we do see things like that, but just saying like in Europe, you can't ask for a range that that's certainly not the case. Um, like the reality is that uh, every position has, uh, especially in a large organization, has a salary range, right? This is this is the nature of compensation. You have to do it that way in a large organization because if you don't, one of the dangers is that you could have somebody who's supervising a bunch of workers and the workers are paid more than the supervisor, okay? Which would be a bad situation for multiple reasons, okay? So to prevent that, every position has to have a salary range, like a minimum, a maximum, and um, you will move up through the range due to seniority. You will also move up due to performance, and different companies have different ways of calculating that with points and things like this, okay? And depending on how many levels you have, that goes way, all the way up to the C, uh, CEO. So that's one thing why CEO pay is not just about CEOs, it's about like setting the maximum range for all the other, uh, you know, levels of employees. Okay, so they will have a range uh, in most industries in most countries. There'll be a range. It'll they they never apply. They never like post a job, not knowing how much money they're going to pay. You know, they'll have a range. They'll have an idea. Okay, we're going to pay. It's going to pay between this and this, right? Even in smaller companies where it's not so formalized, they will have a pay range in mind. Now, like poker, this is one of their cards. They're not going to want to reveal that, okay? So they're going to try and keep that a secret. So if you ask about it, they say they might say, "No, I'm not going to tell you the range," or "We don't know." Yeah, yeah, we don't know how much money we're paying. Like you know, yeah, like anyone's going to believe that, but that's what they say, right? It's just so they don't give you an answer, okay? Because they don't want to give you an answer, but yet they want you to tell them exactly how much money you need, so then they can underbid you, right? Or undercut you. Okay. So, I mean, the range is uh, an answer. Not because you really need to know their range. It's because you don't want to give an exact number. Because whatever number you give, this is how much money I need. They're going to come in less, a little bit less than that and offer that much to you if they want to hire you. Okay. And the other thing is that, like I've said extensively in a lot of videos, if they're asking you the salary question early on in the process, they don't care. They're not asking because they want to pay you that much money. They're asking to try and eliminate you. You want too much money? Okay, sorry, we're going to go with somebody else. That's the only reason that they're asking that question. So it's a pass-fail question. So if you say too much money, you fail. So the way to get through that question is you don't give an answer. Okay? Because if you have to give an answer, either it's really low and you pass the question, but then they offer you only a little bit of money at the end, or it's too much and they just eliminate you outright. So it's a, it's a fail, fail situation. Once you give an answer, the way to do it is to not give an answer. Um, the best thing is to give a range and say like, look, it's like, I hardly know anything about this job other than the job posting. You know, it's very hard for me to say. I mean, um, if they really push you on this, between you and me, what companies do is they'll say, okay, here's the job description. Here's what you're going to be doing. And then you get hired and then unbeknownst to you, oh, uh, by the way, uh, you're on the midnight shift. Or by the way, you have to work four days a week, 16 hour days. Or you uh, occasionally, or not occasionally, like 80% of the time you're traveling to some place out in the middle of nowhere where you're going to be doing the job. Oh, and by the way, you're going to be working with some of the meanest people, a bunch of psychopaths and jackasses that are going to make your life absolutely miserable. Okay. That's, that, that's what this job involves, right? So you take the job and then you realize later that, you know, this is the working conditions. So this is how they get you, right? 
So it's early days. You can't say how much money you're going to need to deal with that, right? Oh, my mouth is getting dry. It's also because I'm so passionate about jobs. No, I want to see people succeed. I mean, you guys can obviously tell. I have a chip on my shoulder from early on in my career where I had to deal with a lot of recruiters and uh, they were, they act the way they do. You know, there's some good ones. I've met some good ones, but there's a lot of bad ones. And I've, for the life of me, I don't understand why a lot of organizations allow those people to operate the way they do because they are, quite honestly, they're um, really soiling the reputation of the, of the company. They're really damaging their brand by going out there, lying to people, behaving the way they're beha behaving, totally unprofessionally. There, a lot of them are just plain rude. Um, they're off-putting. They are a walking advertisement for bad business. And I have no idea why companies sort of allow that to continue. They, they seem to think that's the only way that job can be done. And I know f with the evidence of my own eyes that that's certainly not, th not, not true at all. And it's, it's such a shame what they're doing, especially to people that, um, you know, that they're, they're just starting out in their careers. They don't have a lot of confidence. They don't know how this stuff works. And, uh, you know, you encounter these people. And it makes you want to go and live on a desert island where you'll never have to deal with them ever again. And the reality is that you don't have to deal with these people. There are ways around dealing with them. There's much more positive ways to get jobs. And much more forthright. Okay, uh, Milan says, what is more attractive for the hiring manager? A person who has a lot of experience but is beyond the peak of a career or a person with a lot of potential but with no skills or experience? Okay, well, the answer should be B. But in fact, in most uh, cases, when you're talking about uh, most hiring managers, the answer is A. Okay, they care about experience. And that's all they care about. But like in terms, like it's what you have. It's not your potential. They don't care about that. Um, now, you and I both know that that's ridiculous because what matters is um, your potential. Especially if you're going to be there for more than, say, a year, right? Um, we all know this. The problem is, is that... Uh, the way companies are set up is that they have to, especially in this day and age, they have to bring an employee on board so that they are productive now, okay? They don't have time to undergo a long learning curve with that employee and train them and wait for them to find their feet and uh, develop new skills, you know. Uh, this is the problem. It's very, very short-sightedness. Now, I've been guilty of this, okay? When, I, when I've hired people, unfortunately, I've had to follow this too because, um, you know, I'm, I'm subject to those rules too. I need people to be productive now. And, uh, I mean, obviously, you would like someone that's both. You'd like to have, have some skills now, but yet have a lot of potential so that if they work out and they do a great job and they're capable of doing more, that's a, that's a perfect scenario. That's, that's what you would like. But if you're asking what's more important to get a job now, it's experience. That's, that's the problem. But the thing is, what's much more important than that is if they like you as a person. This is what nobody says. That's what job interviews are about, how much they like you. The reality is that a lot of recruiters and hiring managers, they don't know how to assess somebody. They think they do or they pretend that they do, but they don't. They talk to one person. This person has got five years experience, but no degree. They talk to another person. That person's got two degrees and no experience. You know, they don't know who's going to be the best person for the job. Usually when you get a choice like that, it comes down to the hiring manager themselves has two degrees. So they go, oh, I like the person with two degrees. Right? even though they're probably 
they would probably do a much worse job than the person with five years experience. You know, this is why it's more based on random chance and the person you just so happen to be up against that's assessing you. It has hardly anything to do with you. You go for your next job. You're interviewing with a hiring manager who's got 20 years experience and no degree. If you have two degrees, they look at you and they go, what use are those two degrees? I don't have a degree and I do just fine. No, I don't want that. They look at the person with five years experience. They go, ah, now here's someone who's qualified. Right? It's silly. It's stupid. It's that, that, that's, that's what you're up against. That's what the situation is like. Okay. What's more important is do they like you in the interview? If you have two degrees and they have no degree, so they're kind of biased against you to begin with, but you're super amiable, you're friendly, you get along with them great, you show up to the interview, you're even kind of dressed like them, so you look like you fit in perfectly, you know? And they go, oh, I, I like that person, they're, they're fun. I'd want to work with them, right? It's so stupid. But this is how it works. So, like I always say, the best thing you can do is work on being likable. Work on being friendly and amiable and getting along with different types of people. That's, that's really hard. Like if you're interviewing with some introverted technical person, or you're, inter you're interviewing with some really flamboyant sales type person, but both of those people end up liking you, and wanting to work with you, that, that's a real skill. If you can cultivate that ability, my friend, you are going to have a good time in life, in, in your career, okay? Because you are going to be up against different types of people, and the ability to be liked and be able to get along with all of them is a tremendous skill. This is some, not something that's taught. This is something you're kind of left to figure out on your own. If any of you guys are more experienced, you know, you're like, you know, managers, executives, I don't know if we get those in the chat, but you will know what I'm talking about. Thank you for sending in such intelligent questions. You've got, you, you know, you, I always wonder what the hell I'm going to talk about for like two hours or whatever. And then within like five minutes, you guys are asking like these amazing, great questions that, you know, are uh, really insightful. Like, I wonder what videos to do on my channel. What, what topic should I choose? And I, I have some, sometimes I have a hard time thinking of something. And then you guys are asking all these like awesome questions. I have a lot to say and they're, they're, I, I can tell these are things that a lot of people are going through. So keep them coming. Uh, this channel is indispensable. It's helped me so much. Thank you. Thank you. That's very flattering of you. Um, I sent a message to a person on LinkedIn about a job I applied for, and he said he would show my resume to his hiring manager. Should I follow up with that person or should I leave it be? Well, if you leave it be, um, usually nothing else is going to happen. It does take extra time and effort on your part, but, you know, it's like it. It's like not trying, you know, almost. I know where you're coming from. You like don't want to, um, you don't want to appear too eager. You don't want to step on anyone's toes. Like I get it. I get it. But usually uh, the way things go in this kind of stuff, if you just don't do anything, just nothing happens, right? You have to make things happen. So in the absence of really knowing any more details than that, I would say just it couldn't hurt. If, if, you, if this is something you really, want and you really think there's a there's a chance follow up the only thing you risk is your time being wasted but at least you did all you could okay but that's a good question dave joined from zimbabwe zimbabwe hello zimbabwe are you in harare that's the capital or at least it used to be all the capitals i know are like 30 40 years old so I know what the capitals used to be 40 years ago. It's usually, uh, you know, it's, it's an invitation to show how ignorant you are by like talking all about something that you think is true. And then people say, no, no, you're wrong. But yes, hello, Zimbabwe. That's awesome. Um, how do I get a new job without looking like a liability issue 
due to a worker's comp, the question that happened in your last job, why did you quit? It was simple, just don't reveal that. I know that sounds weird. That sounds like, is that a lie if, I, if they ask me and I don't? Look, here's the deal, okay? Um, I'm going to give you sort of my opinion on this, okay? If, if any of you guys, you disagree with me, that's, that's perfectly fine. We all have our own opinions. We all have our, uh, our principles, okay? But um, look, a job interview is not a deposition. They're going to sit you down and they're going to ask you some pointed questions. And you feel this pressure to answer them all and give them full and complete information, okay? This is not a court of law. They don't have the right to demand that you answer something that you don't want to answer, okay? Now, there's a difference, okay? In this situation, to me, this applies. There's a difference between lying, okay, where you say something that's just not true, and not disclosing something, okay? Like, for example, they're going to ask you a question, something like, tell me why we shouldn't hire you. And you're going to say, oh, well, um, you know, I'm late a lot. And, you know, quite frankly, in my last job, most days I just wasn't interested in doing my job. And, you know, sometimes I kind of phoned it in and I didn't really, I did kind of the minimum because I just, I was having an off day. And, um, you know, I'm forgetful. Sometimes I forget things, right? So like you say this stuff and they say, okay, well, thank you very much. I'm, I'm, you gave a great answer and I'm, I'd like to thank you for being so uh, candid and you know I appreciate your candor and then they your big reward is they don't hire you right if they're going to judge you on these silly questions because they don't they, they want to get to know you but without putting the time in to actually get to know you they think that these questions reveal who you are which they don't okay as evidenced by the fact that you can listen to a YouTube channel like mine and other people's and learn how to pass these questions. You haven't changed, it's just that you gave the slightly different answer and they go, okay, now you're qualified for this job. It's stupid, it's silly, right? So they don't have the right to an answer for any question they ask. You're not in the court of law, okay? So if you don't want to reveal why you left your last job, you don't have to. Especially when it makes you look bad because that's the only thing they know about you. Would you hire a person that you just met, they wear a blue shirt, their name is Fred, and they got fired from their last job? Would you hire that person? Probably not, right? Unbeknownst to you, Fred is the fastest person to do math in this hemisphere, okay? You know, in the northern hemisphere, whatever hemisphere you're in, they're the, they're, they can do math in their head faster than anybody else, but you don't know that. All you know is that they wear a blue shirt, they're called Fred, and they were fired from their last job. Would you hire them? No. So for that reason, if they're asking you about something that's going to make you look bad, especially when they don't, have, they don't have the right to an answer, I would say don't say it. Instead, so if you went on workers' comp and that was a, somehow the reason why you quit, um, I would say just, you know, I, I had a great time there. I was just time to move on. You know, I'm ready to do more. I'd like to do more than just that job. And I'd like to move on to something like this, you know, for this reason. And that's why I left that job. And that's why I'm here now. You know, I mean, that sounds benign enough. It's not a bold faced lie. And, uh, they don't have the right to this information if you don't want to disclose it. They're going to try their best to get, get the dirt on you. You're going to try your best to give them only the good stuff. That's how this works. And if you don't believe me on that, look at like every piece of advertisement you will ever see in your life. It follows that principle. They're not going to lead with, buy this product. It has, it does break sometimes, but you'll probably be okay. <laughs> They're not going to lead with that, right? They don't have to disclose that, so they don't disclose it. Instead, they say, oh, this is the best thing ever, right? You know? It's stupid. It's a shame that we live in that world, but we do. And, um, you know, so knowing this, we adjust our behavior. Look on the bright side. Look on the bright side. Put a positive spin on everything. 
I don't like to choose my salary. Yeah, I know. It, it's, it's living proof that the salary doesn't mean anything. It's not based on anything. You know, the fact that they would like ask you, how much money do you need? You know, if everyone just agreed that this is a reasonable amount of money for this job, they wouldn't have to ask that, but we don't live in that world. You know, we have to adapt to these people if we ever want to get by them, if we want to get their approval for them to invite us in. And listen, you don't have to sell your soul. You just have to answer a few delicate questions, you know, with a little bit of diplomacy and that's it. That's all you got to do. Okay, I got a job in a huge company a couple of weeks ago. Thank you for all your advice. Congratulations, Scorpio. That's great news. Um, you obviously did a great job. Uh, someone says, hello, I have an English literature degree and I'm getting an MBA. Do you think that's a good idea since I want to change careers? Uh, change, change them for what? Like from English to business? Look, an English degree is a good thing. Now, in a lot of circles, it's not always recognized as a good thing, but it is a good thing. If you can string a sentence together and you can speak very well and uh, you know how to put your thoughts and ideas down on paper accurately, eloquently, persuasively, that's an incredible gift, okay? If you know how to construct an argument very, very well, that's also a highly valuable skill. Okay. In short, like I don't have an English degree myself. I'm sort of extrapolating on what it is based on what little I know. But, um, you know, in the area of communications alone, that's a really, really useful thing to have. Okay. Now, an MBA is business. So, I mean, if you're going to go into business, it's understanding how to succeed in a business how all the different parts of business come together, some elementary, well, not elementary, but, you know, intermediate business strategy, things like that, okay? Uh, now, if you're going to combine those, yeah, definitely. I mean, the, the only thing that, like, immediately jumps to mind for me is working in a PR department or something like this. Um, you know, anything that requires communication in a business context, I think would that, that, those would definitely be useful. Now, the big challenge is, I don't know how many recruiters really understand the value of an English literature degree or an MBA, because I don't think there's many recruiters that really have either of those, even MBAs, you know, I, I know there's a few, but there's not a ton. Okay. And if you want to change careers, by definition, you can't use your experience uh, to change careers because your experience is going to be in one career. You're trying to get a job in another career where you have no experience so far, right? So. Um, your ability to communicate, you know, either your pitch or to develop a rapport with people, that's going to be paramount. So, yes, I do think those are useful. Um, you know, I think it's independent of changing careers. It's like, you know, uh, the, the ability to change a, a career successfully, in my opinion, doesn't really depend on what qualifications you have. It, it depends more on how you go about to get a job in a new uh, industry where you don't have a lot of experience. But these are some great questions. You know, keep them coming, guys. Uh, somebody says, when answering the topic question, should you focus on goals in terms of job function level or stick to a certain competency development like you'd have in the coming five years? Um, neither, neither. Uh, I gave my recommended answer to that at the beginning of the live stream. Uh, the bottom line is very quick recap. The question is a trap. Don't engage with it. Okay. Uh, if you say anything other than, you know, I want to be here. Okay. It's, it's an immediate fail, usually an elimination. Okay. If you say the perfect answer, it's like, you know, where do you see yourself in five years? I see myself right here and maybe advancing. 
Okay, it can sound too good to be true. So you don't want to engage, okay? So the, the answer I recommend is you don't engage. They're not asking the question to really see where you'd be in five years. They don't care where you're going to be in five years. They don't care where you think you're going to be in five years. They don't care where you're actually going to be in five years. They're only asking the question to see if you're the right type of person for this job. Okay? And uh, so, so personally, my opinion, I would not get into any of that. I would sidestep the question and then get back to talking about why you are the person that they should hire, talking about your qualifications, talking about why they should hire you, showing off your communication skills, things like this. Okay, so that's you phrased a, a, an intelligent answer, but unfortunately, um, uh, your you know that kind of thinking would best be uh, reserved for giving them compelling reasons why you can do the job. You know, a lot of times they will ask you questions about the job itself. They won't use these cookie, cookie cutter questions. If you're up for like, um, like, I don't know, I think the last job interview I did, like where I was being interviewed was like for a teaching type job. And they said like, you know, well, how would you um, teach a class or how would you uh, handle if you had a disruptive student or how would you like, you know, they're asking you technical questions about the job and they're looking for you to kind of, you know, just rattle it off. Like if you know your stuff, you should have an answer just ready. It should, you shouldn't have to be like, Ooh, you know, like you're thinking about it. You don't really know. Okay. That a lot of job interview questions will be like that too. Do you recommend hiring headhunters to promote your resume to have your dream job? Hmm. Oh, no napkin. Okay. I'll just spill my drink all over myself. Do I recommend headhunters? No, I don't. I mean, a lot of times that's, that's quite hard to do. There's not many... Like, unless you have millions of dollars to spend or something, uh, you usually don't see that. Yeah. Huh. I apologize. I managed to get my Red Bull to go down the wrong way, and then I spilled it down my shirt. That's how you know you're professional. Um, yeah, like, look, they, they've shown that in movies and things where people, like, would hire an agent, some uh, person that is familiar with, uh, you know, hiring circles. Presumably they work in HR to go and find you a job. They also have that service at some large companies, a large enterprise. I forget the name, but the, you know, it's a benefit. The idea is that if we ever have to lay you off, we will provide a service where we help to find you another job, right? That, that, that's a benefit that some large companies provide. Um, so that does technically exist, but the problem is, is that the large company doesn't have any interest really in finding you another job. So, you know, you know, that's, that, that, that's the thing. Um, yeah, usually that it doesn't work that way. Usually you find yourself another job. Nobody cares about your career like you do. And, um, you know, in some high level circles, you can get that. But for most, like 99% of people, that will not even be an option. Okay. Because even though that service might technically prov be provided by a few private HR companies uh, that do executive search, whether true executive search or they just call themselves executive search, um, it doesn't really, it's not really that effective because nobody cares about your career like you do. Nobody knows your potential like you do. So, if you have the opportunity to do that, great. But for most people, I wouldn't even look down that path because it doesn't, it doesn't exist. Now, Paul has given me a super chat, right? That's a super chat. I don't know the difference between a super chat and a super sticker. I think that's a super chat because it keeps scrolling. Yeah. So thank you very much, Paul. You are awesome. You are all awesome, by the way. But right now, Paul is definitely awesome. So thank you. Uh, but Paul didn't ask a question. If you had a question, Paul, you can, you can ask it and I would definitely get to it. 
Um, do you recommend an MBA or a PMP? You mean which one? Like, like, do I recommend either of them? Uh, they're both useful in for for different reasons. Um, if I had to choose between an MBA or a PMP, I was only going to have one. I would recommend an MBA, but that's in a general sense. Uh, depending on what type of job you're going for, if you want to be a project manager or you are a project manager, um, probably a PMP would be perceived better. I think that, personally, I think that an MBA would be more useful for you if you are a project manager, but it's not going to be perceived that way. The employer is going to perceive a PMP as being more pertinent if you are a project manager. So if that's important to you, like you want to get a job in the world of project management, Unfortunately, I would say a PMP would be the way to go. It's, I believe it's quicker, it's cheaper, and it's more pertinent to being a project manager. But um, PMP stands for Project Management Professional, by the way. Uh, MBA, though, is a much better thing to have. Because PMP, a lot of it, like, I was familiar with that stuff several years ago, and basically, it's a qualification in bureaucracy. That's what it is how to write a report, how to get approvals for a report. Like, you know, if, if that's the type of person you are and that's the type of job you have, sure. But for a general ability, like, like if I would recommend what would be a more valuable thing to know, I would say hands down MBA, Masters of Business Administration, because that is a bunch of general principles that you can apply to anything and it even allows you to take your future in your own hands. Like, look, I hate always using myself as an example, but like if you wanted to do what I'm doing, I'm doing a YouTube channel. Like it seems pretty benign, right? But how do you make a YouTube channel successful? Well, that has to do with business and marketing and, you know, sort of uh, understanding customers, viewers, giving them what they want packaging it prop properly. Like that's all marketing. That's all part of business. How do you elevate yourself above other YouTube channels? That's all business. So an MBA would tell you how to succeed with a YouTube channel because the same principles apply. So for that reason, I would recommend an MBA over a PMP. Now, okay. You guys know also that I'm sure I'm biased here too. I have a course called the $100 MBA you know that's coming. Uh, link in description if you're interested, where uh, you pay $100, you take this course of mine, and what I do is I give you a book list so that you order the same books that they are, that they are reading in an MBA program. It's the same ones used in universities, in top universities around the world, okay, like in Harvard and things. You're using the same textbook that they are. And you can get it cheap on Amazon. You can order the same book, maybe a couple editions older for like literally $5. So I give you all that. You read the books at your own convenience, no tests, no assignments. And uh, there's several videos from me. I guide you through it. And uh, you can go as deep into it as you want, or you could just get a very quick overview. You do it completely on your own terms. The catch is that it's not accredited, so you can't say like MBA after your name and have that be accredited, but you gain the skills, okay? So instead of paying $10,000 for an MBA, you're paying $100. You don't get the accreditation, but you get the same skills, especially if you are passionate about learning it. Um, you could take five years to do it, I mean, but eventually... Like, you don't have to, but you could take that long to, to read these books or to skim them or whatever. But you get there, and then that will help you do better in your own job. It'll give you the ability to uh, make any kind of entrepreneurial venture successful. If you ever want to go into business for yourself, you'll at least know all the principles. You know, so, so obviously I'm biased towards that. You know I'm going to say MBA. Um, but... Yeah, like a PMP is, uh, they teach you things like agile and, you know, all these like methodologies, but quite frankly, like I was a project manager for six years, something like that. And, uh, I didn't have a PMP. I knew people that did. I mean, the stuff they teach is really not rocket science. It's stuff you can read out of a book, in my opinion. Then again, I don't have a PMP, so 
it's so easy it's easy to talk about something when you don't know about it uh but that's a great question no one's ever asked me that so congratulations uh i think the experience in some cases is very important yes experiences is important but the thing is look look it's a, it's a two-edged it's a double-edged sword everybody talks about experience okay experience is important up to a point there is a problem with experience and that is that if you learn everything you know from experience the problem is the only thing that you can do is something that you've done before that's the problem with experience okay the moment you encounter a situation you've never been in before that's when you run into problems that's why educational qualifications can help you okay now don't get me wrong i've met a lot of people that got fancy degrees and they haven't done anything and i would not hire those people okay they're arrogant you know they think they know it all they think it's all easy they're completely ignorant to like the realities of doing this stuff in the real world you know so there's a place for both but the problem is is that if you have experience and no training no ed no education of any kind the moment you're faced with a problem that you haven't seen solved before you have no idea what to do you have to start trial and error okay that's the problem as opposed to somebody who knows the theory okay one thing about that is that if they encounter a problem that they haven't personally dealt with before they at least know the type of solution that's going to probably be needed they know where to look they know the approach to take they don't have to do trial and error they skip to what's most likely going to work okay obviously this is a generalization but that's the difference between having those two backgrounds so somebody that's really good will have both you have a little bit of education you have a little bit of experience that makes you very very formidable and also it depends on the attitude you've got to have the right attitude you can't have this arrogant sort of i know it all attitude you've always got to be open any hiring manager that really knows what they're doing they're going to look for that attitude they're going to look for somebody that uh doesn't walk into a situation thinking they know everything and thinking that they've seen it all and they can't be taught i've seen people with tons of experience and no education have that attitude and i've seen people with the opposite lots of education and no experience have that attitude and they're both wrong they're both sorely wrong as i have witnessed several times that's the end of my rant and preaching for today but the problem is a lot of recruiters, they don't understand any of this stuff. So, I mean, you're, it, it's neither here nor there. This is between you and me as a career type thing. It's not really helpful to know that in a job interview because these people are ignorant of that. They don't know how to assess you most, most of the time. Okay, so here we go. Someone says, as a hiring manager, I try to make the interview less formal. Yes, yes, exactly. So I can help candidates feel more normal. Do you recommend this approach? Wholeheartedly, yes. That is exactly what you should do. You, if you want to get to know someone, you get to know them. You take the time to get to know them like a friend. You have informal conversations. Okay. It's disarming. It's a low pressure situation. The problem is, is that that takes time. That takes time and effort. That's why if you want to talk purely in terms of efficiency, that's why people don't want to do it. Right. They also don't know how to do it right either, but, but that's the number one reason why recruiters don't do this, but that is the right thing to do. It's just that you've got to put more into it. So yes, that is the answer. That's how you assess somebody properly. Uh, Hu Lang says, nice topic. Maybe Hu Lang is soft spoken. Nice topic. Question. I worked for years in education. Now I got a chance to manage a school. I'm okay with the academic part, but what do you think I should study to keep ranking up? Love from Italy. <clears throat> oh, there's so much I could say about education. I don't know if I should. 
listen, um, I've, I've done some teaching. I've gone back and taught like in universities and stuff and, um, to, to mixed results. Some of it was really good. Some of it was really not. Um, look, if you're managing a school, uh, that means you have to go right up against some of the hard questions. You know, you have, you have to make tough decisions. Okay. So it might be a little of a different role than if you were just like a teacher, like you said, you worked in education. So whatever role you were in, if you were in the administration or you're, you're a teacher, I'm not sure, but, um, you know, th there's been some weird changes to education. Um, at least that I've seen in my personal experience since I was in school myself, like in my early twenties to going back as a teacher, there has been some considerable changes. And in my experience, uh, there's a little more emphasis on making people feel good rather than to maintain a standard. And personally, I, I had a problem with that. I mean, obviously you want to be as amiable and as positive as you possibly can, but if somebody gets the answer wrong, it's wrong, you know? So, so that's like, I have, I have some, I've had some interesting experiences with education and, uh, I found that it was so removed from the real world that it was a problem for students because they come out with education. They think they understand and they're in for like a, a real culture shock. It's like a real slap in the face because the world of job interviews for a start, like it, it, it's nothing like the way people are treated in school for the most part, at least what I've seen. I mean, I don't pretend to be the expert on it. Just, just my personal experiences. Um, so you said, what do, what do you think I should study to keep ranking up? Now, I, pres I presume that means the school ranking up or you personally ranking up. If it was the school, I would say maintain standards, quality standards. That's the secret to business success is quality standards. Do any of you guys watch YouTube channels regularly that have really crappy videos? I'm going to go and take a guess and say no. Do you ever go to a restaurant um, regularly, you know, that has really crappy food? I would say no. The ones that survive are the ones with truly good food. When was the last time you heard of a restaurant that had really, really good food go out of business? You probably have heard of restaurants that had kind of okay food go out of business but like truly amazing food and you hear that they went out of business. Usually you don't see that. Okay. Same with YouTube channels. When, where, when was the last time that you had uh, a YouTube channel just fail that had like amazing videos, the best videos on the internet? Probably not very often. So um, quality is the key to success. Okay. People get fooled. It's, it's hard. You think quantity I'm even, I'm even taking a detour myself on my YouTube channel by doing these live streams. This is more quantity. It's not, it's not the best I could get something. It's just off the cuff, unrehearsed, right? I feel there's a place for it, but, you know, am I going to get a million views on this video? No, no. So quality is the thing. So if you want your school to excel, quality is where it's at. That's what's going to elevate you above the crowd. Now, as a person in your career, same thing. If you do a really good job, people are going to care about that. That's what's going to last. That's what's going to matter. Above perception, above everything else. So, um, you know, if you are, if you have a background in academics, learn how to manage, okay? Um, like you don't necessarily have to take an MBA, but learn how to manage, learn how to manage people, learn how to manage a business. Okay. Not that the school necessarily is a business. It's purely, but it's the same principles. Okay. You're trying to give quality education to a lot of people and have a lot of satisfied customers. That's your goal. So and you want to do it in the most efficient way possible and the most effective way possible. So learning business will tell you how to do that. Okay. So that's what I would recommend. That's a great question. Great question.
Thank you, Hu Lang. Okay, hey, isn't it a bit suspicious when a job interview, instead of you convincing them to hire you, they seem to be trying to convince you to join them? Um, no, it's not necessarily suspicious. That is part of their um, purpose, technically. They're trying to attract talent. It's, it sounds like if, if you're left with that impression, it sounds like these people are bad at it, but they are trying to do their job, which is to attract the talent. If they end up being really creepy, then yes, it would be a bad thing. Um, quick thought. I have quit jobs for multiple reasons. A good tactic for the reason for separation is to give the most amicable reason, for example, to pursue education. Uh, yeah, definitely. Uh, everything you say in a job interview should be amicable. Never say anything bad about anyone, about your previous employer, your previous boss, your previous coworkers. Even if you couldn't stand them and you hated their guts, and that's the reason you left. That's totally the reason you left. Don't say that, okay? Because it will get, it will make a bad impression of you. It'll convince the interviewers that you're someone that has a problem with people, right? And you don't want to give them that impression of you, okay? Trust me, I understand. I, uh, well, my version of it is I don't suffer fools gladly. I don't like fake people. So it's weird that I'm in business because there's a lot of fake people and there's a lot of fools, but, um, in, in job interviews is where they all sort of come out to play. Uh, so you, you may, you may have experienced this yourself, but yeah, never say bad stuff in the interview. That's like the kiss of death. <clears throat> yes, I'm currently a teacher in Germany. I want to work in project management since I was, since it was my dream since forever. Okay. I'm starting my MBA degree in December. Do you think that's a good idea? Yes. Yes. But listen, the thing about an MBA is that depending on what industry you're working and the prevailing attitudes of that industry, an MBA itself might not be this thing that, um, how can I put this, is like a career boon. A lot of people take an MBA and then they add an MBA to their name and to their resume and they think that that'll make me look so much more attractive as a prospective employee. People will want to hire me. And then they find that that's not true sometimes. And then they get confused. They don't know what to do and they get upset. So listen, between you and me, an MBA is very, very important information. That knowledge will help you, okay? In ev almost every aspect of your life. I mean, it teaches you how to manage money, teaches you how to manage people, teach, teaches you how to manage projects, how to do things more efficiently, uh, the, what you should do to succeed in which different situation. That's what it's going to teach you. Invaluable stuff. The problem is, is that if you um, had a worker type job, say you had a technical job, okay, you're a painter or a drafts person or an engineer or a lawyer, or, you know, whatever, like a technician, and then you tack on MBA, and you try and convince people that, oh, you know, I should be a better technician, or lawyer, or painter, because I have an MBA, they may not share that, because they'll make the assumption that, oh, because you're an MBA, you have an MBA, you think you want to be in charge of it all, and you think you can be in charge of everything, and because I don't know you, I'm not convinced that that's true. And I don't want to hire you as a worker because if I hire you as a worker, you'll just take the next management type job that comes along and, and you'll jump ship. Okay? So that can be a problem with an MBA. However, there are industries where an MBA is, you know, a golden ticket. Like somebody asked earlier about working at Goldman Sachs. Like in banking, an MBA is well recognized. Okay? So you've got to go to where an MBA is recognized as something good and not something that's, it just means that you're entitled and that's it. And they don't understand the value of it. Okay, so like everything else, you've got to use it correctly. Uh, do, 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 do. Hi there. Uh, there is an open position in my current company in different in a different team that I believe would set me on a better track in my career. And financially, I am not sure they will hire me how to handle it. 
well, you can apply for it. Listen, if there's a chance that people might be uh, opposed to your transferring, like maybe your current boss or, you know, maybe the boss of the new department that you want to go to, speak to them one on one. You know, just say, you know, hey, you know, like, can I ask you a few questions or, you know, do you want to grab lunch or a coffee or something? And then say, like, you know, I know there's this position. What do you think? Like, like, can you give me some more information about what it is? What type of person are you looking for? What's your, you know, goal? If you're talking to your current boss, you could try and smooth it over with them. It's like, you know, um, you know, you could ask them like, you know, uh, certain things. But the problem, I guess the problem that I think about it some more, the problem with asking your current boss it might not be the best idea to talk to them before it happens because, you know, they may oppose it and uh, you may signal to them that you're wanting to leave. That can be bad, especially if your other job that you're hoping for doesn't work out. So maybe, maybe check that. But yeah, talk to the person that's a decision maker for the other job. Okay. Be as friendly and as likable as you can. And let them do the talking. Ask them questions about it. Ask them what they're trying to do. Ask them why they're looking for... If they say we're looking for this type of person, ask them why is that? Is it because you're trying to do this or trying to do that? You know, get them to talk about what their goals are and you agree with everything, okay? That, that's a good thing to do. Can you please start saving the live chats after your live videos, please? Uh, yeah, well, I mean, I, I'm reposting them like two days later. So they are there. This one, same thing. I'm going to remove the live stream and I'm going to repost it as a video like Tuesday or something. So, uh, so they're there. And you can see all the comments that's baked into the video. So, so yeah, don't, don't worry. I'm not, I'm not deleting anything. Uh, oh. I'm losing the battle of trying to keep up with these things. I have to either answer quicker or, uh, or cap it. Um, it's also very small here. Let's see if I can do this. Should companies hire based on their proven experience or fresh graduates have zero experience? Thank you. Um, both. There is def. Listen, you have two employees. Okay. One is very old. One is very young. Okay. The old one, they have a lot of experience. They have a lot of knowledge. Okay, that's great. However, generally speaking, there are some disadvantages. They are very stuck in their ways. They are not as trainable. They also have uh, a, a resistance to learning new things, generally speaking, uh, or, or changing their old ways. Okay? Not necessarily, but, that, but that's a higher risk of that. Okay? The younger employee, they don't have a lot of experience. Um, they tend to not be that effective when they start. They tend to have a know-it-all type attitude a lot of times. Not, not necessarily, but, but you do get that sometimes. Um, but they have boundless energy, okay? Much more so than the older employee, okay? They also have an enthusiasm and an optimism a lot of times. Not all the time, but a lot of times. So it's all good, <laughs> you know? You need all these people. For certain jobs, you would intentionally pick one over the other. Okay, now a lot of companies know this and a lot of companies don't. And, and even less, like I, once again, I'm sort of beating up on recruiters, but it is true. There are some amateur recruiters out there. A lot of recruiters don't know this either. They know it even less than the organizations they represent. Um... But yeah, everybody has value. Every single one of you has value. Everybody has value, as evidenced by the fact that you had jobs before and it's worked out, at least for a while, you know? And whether jobs work out or not is much more dependent on the organization than it is on you. You know, especially if you're a worker, you basically just do what you're told. The only thing you have control over is your attitude. Now, to that point, your attitude is going to be a huge determinant of how successful you are in different situations, okay? It's very easy to go a place and get disgruntled because everybody's disgruntled. You become disgruntled too to fit in. You have this uh, anti-establishment attitude and that can even in some cases, it can go 
even further in the wrong direction and turn into an entitled attitude, like the company owes you everything, but you still hate them and do as little as possible. Um, right? I mean, this is well known. Now, I'm not just picking on workers. A lot of managers have the opposite problem. They become entitled too. They they get little Hitler syndrome, <laughs> you know? Uh, they are no good at managing people. It goes to their head. They become self-important and petty. And um, they develop this attitude that, you know, you're paid to work here, so you need to do whatever I say, and I don't even have to be polite because you're being paid, aren't you? So, you know, I mean, your attitude will be the single biggest thing that determines your career path in terms of getting promoted or getting hired, okay? You know, I hate to say that because if you're in a crappy situation, they treat you like crap. It's hard to have a positive attitude, you know? But just know that if that's you, there are a lot of places out there that don't do that, okay? They do exist. And if you've been miserable in a certain job for a long time, maybe it's worth investigating trying to jump. The problem is the longer you stay in a place, the more it holds you there, right? The more, the more uh, advantage you have in staying. So if you're in the wrong place, you know, and it's just miserable and it's not going to get any better, um, it might be worth investigating. Uh, hey man, I just came to, to say thank you. You're doing a great job, which helped me, which helped me actually. Great. That, that's awesome. Thank you. I'm, I'm, thank you for letting me know. It, it's good to hear that. Some companies don't want people with so much experience because they think that you are not going to let them teach you something new. Yes, and that, once again, is based on the collective opinion of people at that organization. It's, it's part of their culture. They've made this assumption that, oh, you're old, so we can't teach you anything new. That all, it's silly to make these kind of assumptions. You've got to deal with people one-on-one. -on -one. I know that makes it harder to do, but that's the fact. You know? I mean, any kind of generalization like that is idiotic. It's like saying all young people are useless. It's like, no, <laughs> you know, they might not have any experience, but they're not useless. It's like saying all old people are disgruntled. It's like, no, that's not true either. You know, you've got to deal with people individually. It's, it's easier for them to make these generalizations. It's comforting for them. It's because they don't understand people. They don't understand how things work. And this gives them Comfort. They, they, they think, oh yeah, now, now we figured it out. It makes them feel better about themselves. It's not as confusing because now they've decided how things work. Yeah, it doesn't work that way. That's why the best way to hire someone is to get to know them. It's hard. It's time consuming. It's inefficient. But it is the best way of doing it. And that applies to once you're working in the company to develop you. Same thing. They got to get to know you. Presumably, hopefully, your boss might know you somewhat, but not necessarily if you're not on good terms with them. Uh, someone says, thanks for answering my question. I spoke with a hiring manager about a position he wants to fill, and he said he would look at my application. Would your advice be the same to follow up with him? As opposed to what? To not follow up with him? Uh, yes, I would follow up with him. I mean, do it in a reasonable way that follows protocol. You know, like, if it's the first day, don't follow up on the first day or something. I mean, you know, like, like allow a few days, maybe three or four days to go by, and then the, the best way would be in person. If you see the person, you say, like, you know, have you had a chance to take a look at that yet? You know, um, do you have any concerns or any questions I could, I could, uh, maybe, uh, help you with, you know, would do you need any other information that I could provide you with? You know, you maybe ask a question about the job. Is it a, you know, is this part of the role? And then whatever they say, you say, great, you know, good. You know, and then follow up twice, maybe three times and that's it. That's kind of just a general, general thing. 
Oh, I'm starting to I'm starting to lose this battle here. <laughs> I'm going to have to s skip a few because I'm I'm getting a bit bug-eyed here, but um uh Okay, I'll just go through this quickly. Thank you. I studied languages and I'm studying HR management. I wondered whether financial marketing accounting courses would be good future options. Thank you again for your suggestions. Uh, yes, yes. I mean, look, that stuff is great to know. Just like, like studying a language is good to know. If you want to, in terms of applying these, uh, this knowledge to the real world, to like giving you skills, okay? General transportable skills. Being able to write really well, read really well, speak really well is very important. Uh, management skills are also very important, okay? They will help you across the board in almost every career you can imagine, okay? You will at least understand the context in which you work, and you will understand the reasons why things are being done around you. Instead of looking at the world and going, oh, that doesn't make any sense, you'll be like, ah, okay, yeah, I see what's going on, right? Knowing how things work helps you succeed within this framework of how things work so yes but if you want to get a job in management it's hard to just start from nothing and jump straight to being the boss right uh usually we don't see that there are exceptions but usually you have to start at the bottom and then when you tack on management skills presumably you'll have a higher chance of getting promoted and when people put someone in charge, they want that person to know what it's like to be a worker. Okay. Generally speaking, if they have any brains, that's what you would want. You don't want some boss that, you know, has been put in charge of people, but have no idea what those people do. Right. That, that's not what you want. Right. So just having management skills doesn't necessarily mean you could jump right to being a manager. I, I just want you to know that. Uh, in the long game, you will probably come out on top because when you are finally given the opportunity of being a manager, you will be able to kick butt because you know how to do things. Okay? Or if you sidestep the whole issue and do something yourself, you go in business for yourself, uh, which is what I've done for like the last 10 years or so, a little bit more, I think. Uh, you know, like you just know what to do. You know, you know what's the way to make something work. You could be an artist doing paintings, and that's what you want to do. But to be an artist who's successful, you have to make money with it. And the moment you you talk about making money, that's business. So an artist who understands business will probably do much better than an artist who doesn't. You know? Thank you for answering a question about my MBA degree. It's hard to get good information online. Yeah, there's a lot of propaganda if, if people are trying to sell you an MBA degree, like me. But no, I have an MBA myself, and I'm, I'm, I'm with that question, I'm not trying to sell courses. I mean, I'm giving you my opinion. But once again, don't take it from me. Go and verify stuff. Go and verify it with your own experiences. Okay? Don't just listen to people. Try things. Try things. If you want to try to get a job with an MBA, try to get a job with the MBA. Say you have an MBA, you know, you're an MBA candidate, meaning that you're studying it now, but you haven't quite finished. Start applying for jobs. See what the reaction is. Okay. What you could even do, and I mean, look, I'm going to put a disclaimer on this because I'm not encouraging people to do anything dishonest. What I'm saying is that you can... You can do what a lot of companies do in marketing, where they probe the market. Let's say you have a question. Should I release product A or product B? Which one will do better? How much sales will we get? How interested is the public in both of these products? Well, part of that is like market research. You can go and ask people, are you interested in product A or are you interested in product B? But that's not very accurate information. What would be much more accurate is to actually sell product A and see how many people buy it and then sell product B and see how many people buy that, right? Now you know for sure people are voting with their money. They're, they're not just saying, oh yeah, I'd be interested. They're actually buying it. They're committing to buying it and paying their money. That's much more revealing, right? So what some companies do is they actually probe the market. They say, uh, here, we're about to release this product. 
Okay. Um, pre-order yours today and they see how many people sign up for that. And then here's another fake product, which we haven't actually released yet. It's coming soon. Pre-order yours today. This is how much money it is. See how many sales you make. Right. And then they might do something where like, oh, well, we've decided not to develop it. Here's your money back. You know, or something silly like that. And then they've gotten their answer. How many people were prepared to buy that product? How many people were not prepared to buy that product? You know, they probe the market by like simulating what, how it would go. And that's very revealing. Now you can do that with your career. You know, if you, if you want to see if there's any interest in this, Maybe you have no intention of applying for a job right now or taking a job right now, but you can try it and see, see what the response is. If people get back to you and say, yes, we're interested, that tells you something. If they don't, that tells you something else. So do you have to wait till the end of a degree to see if that degree was useful for your career? Maybe not necessarily. Remember, you're not getting a job under false pretenses. This is not like, this is not like fraud. You know, I mean, you're not actually going to get a job saying you have a degree that you don't. I mean, that's not what this is. It's just you're, you're gauging interest. You're gauging the responses of doing this versus doing that. Okay. I mean, there's, there's other ways of doing it, but I mean, that's one thing you can do as a last resort and uh, it does reveal things. Once again, you don't, you don't do anything dishonest, but you just gauge responses. Okay. Uh, that's something people do in product sales a lot. Uh, and I know some people that have tied that to career type stuff too. I mean, obviously that's very dangerous. You don't want to do it to people that you're going to have to go back to later in a legitimate thing. Like, you know, you'd have to be very careful on how you do that, but. I'm kind of regretting mentioning that. I'm sure people could twist that in a lot of different ways. That I didn't mean it, but, um, but yeah. Um, listen, okay. I'm going to take the next like five or so questions that people have already sent in. And then I think, I think we'll have to leave it there. Uh, we're coming up to two hours here. So let's see. Um, somebody says, hypothetically speaking, if you are an interviewer and in front of you, a guy sitting and you have seen a couple of red flags, what will you do? Well, if you're interviewing somebody and you've seen a couple of red flags, usually that's, that means you eliminate them, right? Um, now, if you're in the last round, okay, if it's a multi-round interview thing, and you're in the last round, and it's, there's only three people they're interviewing, and they really like you, okay? And, but, you give a, but you give a couple of red flags, uh, it is, it has been known that they will like just stop and let's go back to that red flag and they'll give you a chance to sort of explain and perhaps r reverse the red flag that has been known if they like you and they, you, you're the front runner. Um, but yeah, like our goal is to avoid red flags because usually they mean elimination. Uh, Julia, the Greek. Awesome. That's an awesome name. You talk a lot about the disconnect between what recruiters think and what is actually good for companies. Where do you think this dis disconnect comes from? Uh, uh, well, there's several reasons. Number one is that, um, it's very hard to assess somebody. A lot of recruiters that are young, they just don't have the experience working with a lot of people. And so how would they know what is necessary to succeed in a certain job. The other thing is that the nature of a recruiter, a recruiter by trade is somebody who specializes in getting candidates. They're given a list of requirements. They're told to get candidates. Um, they themselves, once again, like don't really know what's needed. Their, their job is just to get candidates. And a lot of times the, the requirements are poorly written. They're, they're inaccurate, usually written by the hiring manager. Um, and then you've got the age old problem where it's like everybody has a bias towards other people who are like them. So if you've got a PhD, you'll think favorably of people with PhDs. 
if you only have experience and, you, and you've never taken any education beyond high school, you will probably be, be biased against PhDs because in your eyes, they don't have any experience and you have experience. And you don't understand what a PhD is because you don't have one, have one yourself. You don't see its value, right? So this is the problem. You know, it takes a lifetime of experience to work with many different types of people and see their value, see what they're good at, see what they're not good at. And the other, the other fact is that the other fact is that culture is self-sustaining. If you surround yourself with the same type of people as you, it's hard to get an objective opinion on how qualified those people are because that's all you ever see. I mean, there's, there's many factors, you know, but also I think there's a certain amount of arrogance it's people that think they know how to assess people, teaching others how to assess people. And uh, I think that's also a factor too. But that's just my opinion. I mean, this isn't scientific. It's just my opinion based on my experience. Uh, thank you for all your comments. Yes, thank you. You guys have been awesome. Thank you for sending so many intelligent questions. Um, you know why it's taking me a while to catch up? It's because You've inspired me to talk a lot about each of these questions. That's, they're so good. I'm not reading these going like, oh, I don't want to talk about that. Or that's stupid. You know, I'm not having that reaction. So that's great. You guys are on the ball. Love your channels and videos. Amazing. Thank you. That's very kind of you. I, I'm glad that, I'm glad that you, you listen to me sort of droning on about things endlessly. Is there a way we could or I could work for you. I love your communication skills. I, yeah, these are the communication skills you love. I love your communication skills, especially when it comes to employees. I value clear communication and truth and honesty a lot. Listen, I'd love to take credit for the honesty thing. It's just not possible to be really honest a lot of the time when you're a manager, when you manage people. So, um, I try to be, but I mean, it, your, your hands are tied. Your, your hands are really tied. Um, but thank you very much. I mean, that's one hell of a compliment. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm just sort of in business for myself, really. I'm not, I'm not really hiring anyone at the moment. I, I've, I've made a, a, quite a shift in my life going from the sort of corporate world to being just like a consultant, which is what I am. And I do the YouTube thing on the side. And uh, I, in fact, I enjoy the YouTube thing more than I enjoy the consulting part. Um, you know, uh, I, I like the consulting part, but, but I like the YouTube thing even more. And uh, yeah, like, you know, look, if you're a good person and you, you like dealing with people, I mean, I'm an introvert, but I like, talking with people uh, about something that we enjoy talking about. I think that having good relations with people is, is really important in a business. I've probably developed this opinion because I've been in such bad corporate cultures for the first half of my career. People were nasty. People were mean. People had terrible communication skills. Morale was generally low. Um, you know, there is a lot of very unreasonable management and then a lot of very unreasonable employees doing this, you know? And I was very fortunate in that I ended up working for a smaller company that sort of opened my eyes to how you could be in business. But yet, it's a very positive environment. Yet, people were working hard, not taking advantage of the company. Um, bosses were smart. They knew their stuff but they also treated people very well. I also saw beyond the sort of human element, they also aced at the business element because they managed to gather a lot of very talented employees that could command much higher salaries. They could have made a lot more money working for much larger companies in the same city, but they intentionally didn't go and work for them. They stayed at the smaller company because they were treated very well. They were treated like human beings. Um, so it made good business sense 
to have a very positive culture, to treat everyone like, you know, like a human being. I hate saying the word family because that has all these bad connotations, but you know, like to really be nice to people and to be reasonable with people and, uh, you know, treat people that way. I saw the firsthand, I saw the advantages of doing that. And that won me over. Um, it's not original to me. I learned from, uh, some, some greats that, that came before certainly me. Um, but yeah, that, that's the way to do it. And that applied to their hiring practices too. You know, um, they didn't have a bunch of empty headed recruiters asking you canned questions to try and assess if you were a good person. They did it completely differently, you know, uh, and that's the way to do it. And I've done that ever since. So yeah, and more people should do that. Um, I will say this is just to sort of end off. Um, I think I might've mentioned this previously, actually recently, but anyway, I'll say it again. The, I, I took a tour of, uh, the, uh, like a really big charity, like corporate charity, um, that has branches like, you know, globally and, uh, the CEO of the local, um, uh, operation in, in, in my hometown, uh, gave me a tour of the entire place. And I saw all these people, um, working for very little money, but they were very, very dedicated and they were very hardworking. And, uh, they were showing up almost like as a volunteer position to do really hard work. Some of it unpleasant for very little money. And, that's juxtaposed against having seen a workforce that's paid very well, like hundred, you know, over a hundred thousand dollars a year, but yet are disgruntled, are lazy. They do the bare minimum of their job. They're very set in their ways. They can't be trained. They can't be told anything. Uh, they, they, re they actively, uh, rebel against following rules and company policy. You know, the, managers and the owners of those companies would kill to have the workforce that was at the charity you know that dedicated and yet these people were making next to no money whereas the people in the company were being paid exorbitant amounts of money um what's the difference it's the way you treat them so i mean this isn't just a human kind of touchy feely kind of topic this is a business topic this is how you succeed in business by treating people this way, you know? So there you go. Um, that's pretty much it. We're going to, we're going to wind this up. Uh, John Lewis says some very nice things. Thank you, John Lewis. That's really kind of you. Um, is an MBA valuable in it? Um, well, it depends what job in it. Okay. If you extend it to startups, oh yeah, it's, it's the heart and soul of how to succeed, um, despite what a lot of people who don't have MBAs say. Uh, yes, yeah, so if you're a systems admin, I mean, it's all about efficiency. It's all about uh, costs. It's all about managing people, managing money, managing projects. Yes. Oh, yeah, totally. Yeah. Knowing business is very important for IT. That's actually where IT has failed uh, in the last 30 years is because you have IT off doing IT, and then the, usually they're uh, supporting a business the business is over here. It understands business. It doesn't understand IT. IT is over here. It understands IT. It doesn't understand business. So you've got this huge gulf in between. IT is giving solutions that business is not really enjoying so much because it's not helping them with business. There's a huge gulf. If you understand both, there's tremendous opportunity there to be able to bridge that gap. Now, depending on what job you have, you may not be able to, but at least you have an understanding of some of the issues. So there you go. Okay. Thank you so much. You guys are awesome. I appreciate so many of you being here. So many of you saying such nice things. Listen, everybody has value. Okay. You all have value. You know, even if you're looking for a job right now, you're probably at your lowest point. Don't be fooled by that. It's an illusion. You've got value. You're a very variable person. Uh, you're very qualified and you're very employable. It's just a matter of doing this sort of musical chairs kind of matchup game to connect with the people that need your skills. Okay. It can be, it can feel very discouraging at times, but don't lose heart. Okay. Uh, watch videos on my channel, watch videos from other people, L learn from other sources 
and uh, you know, put these into practice. Do mock interviews, rehearse your interviewing skills, um, and just keep doing this and you will succeed. I have a course called Get Hired, like I said earlier, link in description. That gives you the full kind of thing from beginning to end. Uh, check that out if that's of any interest to you. People were talking about MBAs today. If you have an interest, and I have a course called the $100 MBA, it's non-accredited, but it's a way to get the skills without taking a year or two of your life and five figures and getting an accredited degree. This is a much cheaper way of getting mostly the same knowledge, uh, even if you're uh, like for a very little commitment in terms of money and you're entirely able to do it on your own terms. So no tests, no evaluations. You read the textbooks uh, to the depth you want, when you want, and that can help. So if you're interested in that, I have that too. Uh, thank you to my members. There's a couple of people here that are members of my channel. Uh, you can click the join button and um, uh, you get an extra weekly video from me every week. And uh, I have a Patreon for people that are into Patreon. I appreciate all my Patreons. And all the rest of it, like, subscribe, share. This stream will be reposted, I believe, on, on Tuesday, hopefully. Uh, so it won't be deleted. It'll disappear for a day or two and it'll come back. And um, thank you so much. I will be doing some more of these. So if you do have another question I couldn't get to or, or anything, uh, check out some of those. Thank you so much. You guys are all awesome. And I will see you very soon. Take care.